in day one. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are so happy to have you here on Monday morning. I'm Shelly Butler. I mean, just say, yeah. Yes, you are, <laughs> yes, you are. And we are so excited to have Kathy Rogers here today. Yeah, yeah. So excited. So Kathy has spent 14 years as an educator, six years as a politician, minister of finance, minister of social development, as well as minister of health and inclusive community, inclusive <laughs> Communities. Is it inclusive communities? Inclusive, inclusive. communities. Yeah. <laughs> it was with social inclusion. It's okay. And yeah. now, and now I check on, on LinkedIn and you are like, you're freelancing now. Mm -hmm. Sociologist, PhD, you are a project lead. You're a researcher. You'll do analysis. I love that. Education facilitator. I love that. I love that. Where is your sweet spot and all that? Hmm. It's funny because uh, even in addition to what you've said, I was I started my career 17 years in federal government, four different departments, everything from economic development to industry and agriculture to um, public safety in solicitor general and even um, telecommunications. So when I think of all of that together, my common theme is an interest in good policy, good processes, and good customer service. And um, I really, even what I carried into my role as a professor of sociology and into politics, it was all about how can we invest in the quality of life of people so that we can get the best out of people and ensure dignity of people and really to be honest with you, even as Minister of Finance, I always thought the best way to grow your economy is to invest in the quality of life of our people. You have good quality of life, which means health, education, basic needs met. You're going to be a labor force participant and be happy about it. So what better way to grow your economy? That was always my approach. And as well, I would add prevention versus correction, because even when I did my master's and PhD studies, that's what it was all about. It was about, you know, I always said, I worked at uh, Solicitor General, but I always said, my goodness, if we had a preventions Canada, we probably wouldn't need a corrections Canada. <laughs> and, and, you know, right. early intervention, if you can't prevent. Um, and really, that means putting the investments early and up front instead of later, because you've already got your problems, they're harder to correct. So I've kind of carried all those common themes everywhere. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, you really have, you know, uh, I see you posting a lot. I see you posting courageous things, you know, um, <laughs> to have us really think uh, deep dive into it. And I know I've been watching you for years. Um, as you know, I kind of had a sweet spot or, or a spot for the homeless that I thought perhaps mm -hmm. we had so few here in Moncton that I thought we could get ahead of it. Um, it seems overwhelming now. So prevention at the time was for us in, in 2014, 2015. And, and uh, unfortunately, we are here now in corrections mode, right? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's tough. And, and you know, I, I often think, you know, I see people posting waiting for somebody to do something. And why can't it be those of us that are in business? Why can't we do something? Why can't we help one another out? So we get together for International Women's Day and we get together for business lunches or we get to, so why couldn't we get that many people to the plate mm -hmm. to brainstorm how we can mm -hmm. house our homeless, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. How can businesses be proactive mm -hmm. in that? How can we be that preventative measure? You know, it's like when you're, in a barn that has a little hole in the wall and you are standing far away but looking out the hole you only see a little piece right yep but if you get closer to that hole you see bigger landscape and bigger and I think it's common for all of us no matter where we are uh, what type of business or type of profession we're in or the neighborhood we live in we see certain pieces and therefore we make judgments on that so we have all kinds of people that, you know, based on their own experience and their own exposure, um, look at homelessness as or poverty in particular ways. 
And to be honest with you, um, I think education is key. If we could make people aware of the roots of poverty, um, I think we'd have more empathy for being engaged in the solutions. For example, I think an awful lot of people think people are poor as a result of poor choices they've made. And while this might happen sometimes, I'll tell you one of the best sociology books, an old classic from a long time ago that I've ever read is Lauren Tepperman's Choices and Chances. And it's I love all, that book. I love that, yeah. So <laughs> it, it's really about, you know, when we're in a certain position, we have more choices than other people or less choices than other people. And some of our life experiences are a little bit more by chance. And um, so how can we make a difference? I think I always used to say to my students, you can't, I'm going to use a double negative here. <laughs> you can't not know and not act. Mm. In other words, knowledge is empowering. When you learn about the real root causes of poverty and the complexities of it, I think you're compelled to act and to join in on the solutions. So I think becoming more aware um, of some root causes. And in fact, I did my master's um, thesis on why did the campaign 2000 fail, which is the 1989 all government, all party declaration signed with the United Nations goal to eliminate child poverty by the year 2000. Why did that fail? In that 11 year period, child poverty grew 58%. So I wanted to know why did it fail? Well, to make a very long story short, it was a lot of political will and courage that was missing, but also a lot of um, com competition for interests. So whose agenda item is more important and poverty just kept getting pushed down lower so they could put out fires in other areas. But then I carried that further into PhD research and here I studied from the kids' perspectives, because in my mind, I thought, well, surely if people understand the kids, out of the kids' voices, surely if people understand from the children's points of view what it's like growing up in a, a neglect and abuse, what it's like growing up in such poverty that you have no stable housing, you can't make friends at school because you move too much, you have a can of mushrooms in the cupboard to eat, you know, if people could hear kids' voices of how they're bullied at school, if people could hear the kids' voices, surely they would be moved to join in to have good policy, good structures, good engagement to alleviate the problems. Um, and so that's what I did, is I researched it from that perspective. And um, I've always used empathy and I, I feel like I am an empathetic person to begin with. You um, are. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, but I always thought if we could, if we know, we will have more empathy if we're aware. In fact, you know, I've, I've been familiar with the roots of empathy uh, programs at schools and I always, I love the program, but I always thought it's sad that we have to have such a program, you know. I, I have a question. Mm. And I'm not sure if it's like directly related, but like at Dovago, like the way we're trying to, you talked about <clears throat> um, prevention before correction. Yeah. Mm. And then we talked about the problem we have in, in, in uh, the world today and like all these, there's a lot of problems. And I'm, my, my thinking is, my question is uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm instead of like empathy, like having empathy is good it's good but like is forgiveness like i'm just asking it like is because mm -hmm. we tend to say you made a mistake no problem mm -hmm. like okay that's good like okay you learn something so there's mm -hmm. a like there's a behavior that led to that problem right you made a choice but the choice is not necessarily conscious so forgiveness of the choices that we make the behavior we have is kind of one of the like the rules that we go by at Delico from a leadership mm -hmm. point of view. And I, I'm wondering like, if it, the, how does forgiveness play a role into maybe fixing this problem or does it? Like, am I on the wrong track here? No, I don't think you are. Yeah, I don't know if you, how can you not be forgiving if you empathize with someone's situation? How can you not be? Uh, I think we can empathize with, um, 
if we take the time, this is the kind of leadership style I've always valued too. If someone, if, if the manager or leader or director or CEO of your organization takes the time to get to know the people that you have, your team, you want to know their passions, you want to know their motivations, you want to know their needs, you want to know what drives them, you want to know their challenges. And then when you, you know, if you take the time to get to know that, how can, and I am getting to forgiveness, how can you um, not be empathetic when you see a problem or when you see a mistake? Um, because you understand where they're coming from. You understand um, the motive, you know, the motive was pure, the motive was good. It's just, um, I think like, and, and forgiveness is important even when we um, can't relate. So it's kind of a good overriding um, principle and approach, I think, have a forgiving spirit. But with empathy, I don't even know how it's, possible to not be forgiving if you have empathy for someone's situation and i i kind of think in order to have empathy we need to get to know the people and know their situations um but certainly you know building community and having a good strong sustainable community requires relationship and how do you have relationship without um, forgiveness and without empathy for each other and knowing each other uh, I think it's just, it's, it's a requirement. It's essential. It's, yeah, a, I, it's something that um, I struggle with because I don't know if you know, but I made a lot of bad mistakes <laughs> and, and that girl over there in the corner, like Shelly, like she forgiven, she's forgiven me. Right. And every time I would make a mistake, I would go there and say, oh, geez, that was a mistake. She would say, yeah, I forgive you. Just move on. And that built like some sort of, like it built that trust, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and um, a base for me to do something else, to like to push myself a little more, to be a contribution more. And, um, and so forgiveness is kind of a, we don't talk about this in leadership, like in business. We're talking about businesses and like how many people will, in business will say, no, no, I, I forgive you for that, whatever you did, right? or even as a parent or as a spouse or as a friend and I, and the thing i learned with shelly over there is that like i had to forgive other people mm -hmm. like i want to be forgiven <laughs> right? mm -hmm. absolutely that's, that's not the hard part the hard part is me forgiving yeah when somebody's mm -hmm. hitting you when somebody's attacking you when somebody's making a mistake right mm -hmm. i had to forgive yeah, that was the hard part. And um, for me, yeah, in my practice of like, it's the practice of leadership, I would say for me, and, and this is the five practices I do, would be non-attachment, non-reaction, no self, being discovery, and then being the doing. And non-attachment is the forgiving part. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it seems simple. Like, I'm not, like, and I, I started by saying, I don't care. So we're talking about homelessness and people that are in misery, right? Like, or child abuse or whatever you want, like all these mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. So I, and I, I'm guilty of that. Like I, mm -hmm. I, like I was so in my hole that I said, mm -hmm. I can't deal with this. I, so I found myself not caring, right? Mm -hmm. And I was giving money out just to, okay, well, I will appease them for now. But I didn't see, you, you made a reference to the barn, right? And that hole, like I didn't want to see, mm -hmm. like it's because I was afraid to see, right? Like that. Mm -hmm. And it's through the art of forgiveness, right? That I was able to get closer. Yeah, get because there's a restoring piece in forgiveness, right? Yeah. It's in forgiving, if you are forgiving, you're restoring uh, yourself, you're helping the other person to restore and you're restoring your relationship. And, and in in forgiving uh, your own self, it's it's the same thing. You're restoring your soul and spirit yeah. and, and, and your ability to be whole um, because we only have a piece of ourself when we're not forgiving. Um, yeah. 
we get into our head a lot when we're not forgiving Sorry. or they know not what they do for they yeah, know not absolutely. what they do. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are, are unforgiving. I went through life very unforgiving. I had terrible things that happened to me and I felt the world was on me. I think mm -hmm. that or, or against me, at least, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, I wasn't yeah. supposed to have really amount to anything because of mm -hmm. my past. Mm -hmm. What I realized really quickly is, is tell me, no, I can't. And, and mm -hmm. I was actually going to double down and I can, but it took so much forgiveness. It took yeah. the forgiveness of my abuser so yeah. I could move on and I could use yeah. that as strength instead of mm -hmm. use that as being a victim. Right. So for yeah. a long time, absolutely. I used it to throw it out to create sensation, to mm -hmm. create empathy towards me. So you would listen to me. Now what I realize mm -hmm. is, is it's not, I no longer use that for um, uh, getting empathy for me. I throw that out there for shining mm -hmm. the light on others. You can mm -hmm. find the light. If you live mm -hmm. in the darkness, <sighs> the darkness will continue to envelop you. Mm -hmm. So surround yourself by that light, you know, for they know mm -hmm. not what they do. And Absolutely. Uh, right. I'm glad you shared that because, you know, I really, really believe that back to your original question, I believe that's the role of community too, is we are to be that healthy, um, sustaining safety net so that when someone experiences um, real difficulties, especially a vulnerable person like a child, a person with disabilities, a senior, um, someone, a newcomer, when someone's experiencing disabilities, if we have a good community social safety net, we can help that person build up and, and build resilience. And really the essence is, is not to avoid all life's difficulties, it's to learn how to work through them and learn from them and build successes upon successes. And then we have more confidence and more ability to help ourselves and help others. But sometimes, you know, if we have a community that's not there, um, we can be one of those ones that does fall through the cracks and, and not be helped. Because you do see people with really horrific early experiences and some with positive ones and they don't, they follow the opposite paths to what you might think, but it's that, it's sometimes that grade five teacher, it's sometimes that community organization, it's sometimes yeah. um, a best friend that you had, that the yeah. family, you know, it's, it's a variety of things. So sometimes what I'm seeing, or all the time what I'm seeing is, for instance, when we're talking mental health, Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of us that are dealing with mental health issues in the room. Yep. When we're talking about homelessness, there's a whole bunch of people experiencing homelessness in that room. There's not a diverse group. Yeah. So they don't see anything else. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I always thought like if we could bring uh, everybody together to discuss home, uh, 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 emotional yeah you know, mm -hmm. mental health, right? People that are, are, you know, we all, we all experience some mental health yes. of some sort, but yeah. what if it was just community? It wasn't just people that are experiencing mental health mm -hmm. or it wasn't just people that were experiencing homelessness. What if there was that, that diverse group? So what I always found, like, for instance, when, it, when we fed the homeless, like I always thought, well, what if, you know, at lunchtime, um, you know, at the church kind of thing, everybody mm -hmm. went, Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, those that are experiencing homelessness would actually sit beside somebody that is not, and maybe, you know, maybe we could, I don't know, retrain the brain, yeah. right? Because what yeah. happens is we get such victimized, we, we become the victim, right? And uh, they don't see anything else. And, and I think that there's such a, a, a courageous uh, way to go from victim to victorious, you know, and yeah. give people that yeah. confidence back. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And you hit the nail on the head because that's the philosophy behind the breakfast programs in schools. They're for everyone. Right. And it's for that reason. Yes. And you know, when I was doing my research with the kids, if there's one phrase I heard over and over again from kids telling their life stories was, you know, while well, I learned in about grade three that I'm not like the other kids. Oh, if I heard that once, I heard that so many times. Wow. They And they started to, because I took a narrative inquiry. I, I, I'm a narrative theorist. And so I, I, I heard kids shutting down their life story prematurely. Horrible. 
premature foreclosure on their life story. Horrible Absolutely. thing to do at a young age. So yeah. therefore, it leads them on the path to um, having no positive vision for their future. Um, easy to drop out of school, easy to enter into risks like crime and, and substance abuse, because what have you got to lose? Your life story is kind of over anyway. And so risk doesn't mean anything. And so I just found it so important to, um, you know, if we could all, this goes back to your words too, Shelley, if we could all be like the law back literacy, each one teach, each one reach one or each one teach one. And if we could just be neighbors and buddies with each other. And um, honestly, I, I think, and who's our neighbor? Everyone. Everyone's our neighbor. Everyone. Everyone. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're not just the person like us. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And if we could only see that, you know, it's so funny. You mentioned the breakfast program. Eve and I were on this leadership retreat. We were in Sedona just before all this crisis happened. We were in Sedona and there was a lady on the bus as we were leaving. And she said, you know, I've been making my life so hard. My husband and I work really hard for ourselves and we have to leave early in the morning, but I did not want to put my kid in the breakfast program right? They all wanted to go to the breakfast program, the three of them, but what would others think? Because they had enough money to feed their children. So they had actually put that over onto their children, right? Yeah. We tend to, as adults go, only the poor kids are going there. So yeah. we don't want our children to be seen in their Oshkosh bagosh at, at yeah. that, uh, at that. Yeah. So we do that, right? We, yeah. we do that. And sometimes, I mean, this poor woman, she certainly was not thinking, um, anything, she wasn't trying to put the negative on it, right? Yet, right? And realize right. after this retreat, oh my God, I have now put that over onto my child, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so now they're in judgment of the other children that go to, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That go mm -hmm. to the breakfast program. So yeah, we have to be so careful about. Um, we do. And uh, I always said, but by the grace of God, go I, because anything can happen to any of us. And that's what we have to realize. We have to humble ourselves to realize that could be me you know I lost my father when I was 16 he died I lost my brother a couple of years later uh he drowned and I you know when my kids were just babies and I had just gone through divorce and I lost my mother to breast cancer so my whole social safety net was gone and you know there are times that I think now if this hadn't happened I might have slid down that path or if that little thing hadn't happened you know sometimes I like to imagine and play this little game with myself, this like a computer flow chart. What if when this happened, this was my route instead of this? What if when that happened? And it really is um, humbling, humbling to think I could, I could be like that. I could be like that person. So I'm no better than that person. I, in a way, was fortunate to have this or that, or I, I just, you know, it. we are all living, breathing, blooded people. Absolutely. I think, Absolutely. I think you hit a nail on the head. Like the, I heard a speech someone says, well, I worked hard. I deserve this. Like there was yeah. a speech that I bought. A lot of people work hard. Exactly. And um, like we, we as humans forget that the universe gives us things and sometimes luck, right? Yep. And uh, so we keep figuring it, like this is the propagation of, like society today, you like work hard, you'll be successful and you'll be happy. And I remember this speaker at the Titan Summit and this guy said, no, 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 be happy, work hard at it, right? And you'll be successful. And it's been my mind driver since because I, I think you have to really, and I was, I was lucky. There's no, and I was, there's my community, my family, my friends, my, like it played a role in my success and my living. And my being here today, and you're absolutely right. I could have taken a long turn so fast, and why didn't I? This mm -hmm. is a question, right? Like you, everybody gets hit, but the community saying hi, saying like a smile, something as simple as a smile, will yeah. could change a person's life. Yeah, yeah. it's like you're really. You, we all want to be part of something, and you've hit the nail on the head. Like we've had so many speakers here, like so many uh, leaders. Uh, in the in this Monday morning live, and it's all going to come back to one thing: all this thing that's happening, all the problems we have in our in our society today, comes back to one thing, and that's community. Mm -hmm. like being part of something, 
right? And accepting that we're bigger with the community than we are with the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. And we're lucky to be part of this. Community. Like we're in our very, we're lucky here in New Brunswick. We are. We it's are fun. so yeah. lucky. We're like one big community, but we although are. not everyone feels feels a part of it, which is sad, but we have yeah. to do a better job at making sure everyone's included. But uh, yeah. it's easy to know each other here in New Brunswick. It is, it is. Yeah. Whether we want that or not. <laughs> <laughs> so that book that he was talking about, that was Neil Parisha, and that was the book of awesome. And uh, it's an excellent book. He actually yeah. walked the red carpet. He's like the number one blogger in the world. And, and yeah, uh, yeah he just, uh, he was going through divorce and he just yeah. didn't know how to get himself back. And, and uh, it's just a beautiful book. And, yeah. and what he realized first, see, we all, especially us, you know, our generation, we all, if we get a bigger car, if we get a bigger house, if we get a nicer, mm, mm -hmm. we're going to be happy. We know that to not be true yeah. so but it's so interesting that we're talking about this community belonging because when we did our research so we make time tracking software Eve says it's what as sexy as a garbage can and it's true nobody likes to track time but but it's you know you like towards a project you really have to track your time especially if you're billing yeah. that project um or you're getting your costing on that project I mean it's just part of our world right mm -hmm. um but when we went to do our research um to, to find our new way, a new way of tracking our time, mm -hmm. it really came down to it. We had three guys researching it. And of course, all of our business is mostly US based or abroad. So that's kind of where the research happened. But what we saw is belonging. Belonging was number one. They need to make sure that their contribution matters yeah. Yeah. and that they are valued. They never talked about money. They never talked about anything truly, but being finding that belonging. Um, we kind of doubled down on that at Dovaco in 2013, and uh, and have really have made some successful strides. But there's so much more for us to learn. And I think that these Monday mornings, you know, even I have like our philosophy about finding people's talents and making them happy, and and they will create their own space of of, you know, innovation and creativity, and we don't even really have to worry about it, right? Find their happiness. Um, but yeah, I think going back to community, like mm -hmm. always going back to community, making sure we give back is kind mm -hmm. of our philosophy at Dovaco. Like I said to you before, mm -hmm. Estelle has made sure that we have a plan for, um, well, Estelle and Owen actually in the office made sure that we have a plan for supporting our community by making sure every month you know you can go out in the community and do whatever you need to do we have somebody who takes care of mental health provides some uh podcasts and you know uh, i with michelle alcorn or sorry michelle collins rather we do a podcast 50 plus women you know come on girls um and and you know eve also wrote a book called i am a seed but it's so important for us to give back to community and we do this little thing on monday morning and we have leaders like yourself who um, help us kind of broaden our horizons, mm -hmm. if you will. But mm -hmm. if, if you could give Dovaco like one, you know, what should we really invest our time in? There's 35 of us, you know, on the ground in Moncton. What would mm -hmm. you suggest that we invest our time in? How could we make a difference in community? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I can't even get to answering that until I say, I think you're, if not the one of the model employers um, in what you do um, as team as empowering and enabling and 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 just valuing people oh my goodness like you seem to be you take a holistic approach um, in in valuing one's um, whole self so that is so key that many uh, most employers don't do and you know what's interesting? I learned this in federal government many, many years ago, and it's still there today. It's actually written in treasury board policy that, and I'm going to word it a different way, a, a human way, not a bureaucratic way. It's a, it basically says you are to be the model employer that other employers should seek to exemplify. Well, it's definitely not that. Um, I think more about Max Weber's uh, depiction of um, government as a bureaucratic cage that uh, a, a bureaucrat human is put in and caged 
and yeah. become slaves to bureaucracy processes. And, 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 and there is an aspect to that because I've spent so many years in it, in the bureaucratic side and in the political side, federal and provincial. And, and I've, I've seen how it takes forever to make a change. And sometimes your, your person, your identity has no room to show or be an influencer because it's just too massive and too big and it doesn't fit with the round peg in the square hole. And so I think you're already doing a wonderful job there. Now, I know you're small in comparison to a, a great big organization, but still there are a lot of small employers that don't do that. And I think the other focus is you're, you're focused on what I said earlier in the interview, quality of life as, yeah. as, a, as a piece instead of just the economic bottom line. When you focus on the economic bottom line, it's, you're gonna miss your target of what you wanna do. It's, it's just, that can't be your focus. It can be a goal to have a good economic bottom line, but it can't be your focus. Um, your focus has to be quality of life of people. And I think you guys do that well. So how can you play a better role? Well, you know, I always say um, modeling your values is the best advertising, the best influencer you can be and do. So by modeling your own values and showing those and acting on those, others are going to want to copy you. Others are going to want to catch it. You know, it's, it's contagious. What a nice pandemic to spread. <laughs> yeah. so model your values and just keep on, keep on doing. And, and of course you haven't got it perfect. Like no one's got it perfect. We're always in growth mode. And um, as long as we're always in growth mode, great. But take time to maybe go out and speak to different organizations about the approach you take. Um, you know, I, I learn about you from just osmosis, I think, because you're just so everywhere even. And um, it, it's so, we were, we were, and, and it, we it is friends. contagious. We've been friends for a long time. Yeah, it, it is contagious. Right? Yeah. So, I think uh, I think my best advice would be just keep modeling your values and be open and growing. And I think you are doing that. We started this uh, program called Connect. Um, and it's just as deep, like it's this, I have a like a real problem right now because like we used to gather at Doico on St. George Street, and we were going there and, and, but we are like, because we've been, you know, people could work from anywhere in the world at Delco. It's been it's been the policy of ours, and we like the technical team has implemented this. So when the pandemic struck, they go home. We just went home. It wasn't a big thing because we yeah. were already set up for it. Like everything could be from home. But now I'm like, there's something missing. So we started a program called Connect, and it was just with Black Rabbit, of course, because it's like my son's restaurant. And the purpose of that was to, that everybody at Delco could go once a week, anybody at Dovoco could go once a week, reserve a table for four to six people. And we didn't say who and when. And you just go and have dinner on us, right? And, and Black Rabbit's kind of a place where you put your phone down and you sit there for three hours and you eat, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think your, your answer to, your, to the question that Shelly asked has brought me to the, like a little further up on how we're going to change the way we connect, right? Because this is what, like I'm, because we're not connecting anymore. We're not going to the office anymore. And I'm missing that. So how do we, as, I, as an employer, because I don't think this is ever going to go back to where it was. That's what I think. So as employers, we have to figure out how do we connect to our community? Because community is key. Like when I mean the community, I mean the mountain community, our community. How do we do that? And how do we connect to the Dovoco community? So your answer has inspired me to go a little further with connect. And uh I won't say it. We'll talk about it, Shelly and I and the team. And uh, but we have to be part of the community. Like we have to be part of our local community. We have to support our local community, and we have to show up. Mm -hmm. So you, you inspired me to go even further, go out there, and just do something that allows all, all of us to connect because that's the solution. So everybody yeah. can be seen. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. Now is the perfect time to be rebuilding better together mm -hmm. and I know it's almost become cliche a lot of people are talking like this but I think it's important to keep it front of mind 
it's an excellent time to consider and, and work hard to build better and together. And I'm excited about one of the contracts I'm working on right now is um, I'm working with a Senate committee um, to study basic income guarantee for New Brunswick. And um, yeah. it, uh, Nancy Hartling, Senator Nancy Hartling is um, really a strong proponent of this for New Brunswick. And so I'm doing a lot of um, uh, research and uh, trying to pull it together as much as we can to take advantage of the post COVID opportunity. Yeah. You know, we saw through CERB how much um, it was recognized, how it's important to get money to people immediately and ask questions later, yeah. you know, because basic needs, we need the basic, we need to pay the mortgage, we need to pay the rent, we need to get food. And, and um, so let's do that. And then we'll talk and take a breath. So it helps us to learn and we need to, I'm really excited about working on this initiative. I've been a proponent and advocate of this for oh, longer than I can remember. So of course, to take advantage of, I agree with, with your, your remark, Eve, we're not gonna go back to our previous normal and that's not all bad. No. Yeah. Of course, I do miss like you, the getting together and the hugging and the, oh my yeah, goodness, like, too. oh, I so wanna touch people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had such a hugging community. So yeah, it's, it's important. It's important that we, we continue that belonging because it's not about just the yeah. project that we're working on. It's about yeah. the kids' names. It's about the wife's name. It's it about is. what their, you know, what their score was in their game, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and we don't have that around, um, you know, the, the kitchen table anymore at yeah. Dovaco. So yeah, connect is, is going to be really important. And I believe, like you say, it's, it's not, us just working on Dovaco. It's all of us Dovaconians going out to these yes. other places and saying, you know, this is possible. This is this is yeah. possible. Yeah. And Thank you know, I'm not surprised that sorry. I'm no, not no, surprised yeah. that that what you found was more important than money was um, belonging. I'm not surprised in that at all because belonging is validating. It's yeah. validating you as a human being. Oh. I really am of value and of worth and I, I really do have a place yeah, and, and a yeah. purpose. It's so validating. And so that's why I believe it's important for everyone to have that sense of belonging, everyone. And we're not done until everyone does. That's yeah. right. That's right. Listen, yeah. I tell you, when we were trying to change our software to make sure that all happened, it was a challenge. We had been here for 25 years before we started to make that happen. And we thought we knew who, what time management was. <laughs> Don't tell us, we'll tell you, you know, uh, man, did we sit back on our heels and uh, really get down to, to brass taxes. So we made two products this year. They're just coming out and it's team set and show up. And it's truly all about belonging. It's all about community. Um, the bottom line, of course, is, is tracking your time. Um, um, but show up is all about showing up. Making sure those changes happen. So I'm, um, what I've come to realize is just a measurement, right? It's just a measurement to make you realize. But it has nothing to do with belonging. Yeah. It's just a measurement to see, oh, yeah. I could have belonged more or yeah. less. And it's mm -hmm. not a judgment either. It's just, mm -hmm. a, it's just a measurement to bring you here. And yeah. I, this is kind of a switch for me, but belonging is so important. What I, I, can I just say this? Like, I think the government, I think the Canadian government, and I'm not a, I'm not politicizing because we, we have mm -hmm. a conservative provincial mm -hmm. and we have a liberal federal. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is the Canadian government, to me, if you want to spur innovation, you have to take care of the necessities and they've done a good job. You guys have done a yep. good job, right? Yep. So yep. when, when, when people are saying, okay, I have money to pay the rent and, yeah. and food. Now I can be innovative. Now I can be creative. Now I can yeah. start my business. Absolutely. Now I can do that. So true. So that's Absolutely. what I mean as a business person. You know, it's a hierarchy. And, it's and they're gonna, like they're going to be abuses. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. they're going to be people say, oh, I made so much money. And like, they're going to, like, I don't really care because the overall, like there are people and you watch this happen. You watch innovation in Canada change, right? Because of this. Yeah. So hats off to that. 
Yeah. yeah, hats off to that. And it's so true. You know, my daughter is a school teacher, just graduated from Crandall University, mm -hmm. right? Going into teaching and that pandemic hit. She not only didn't get to walk and do her graduation, but that uh, pandemic hit. But that CERB was there for her. So not mm -hmm. only was she able to continue her life and, and she bought a home early, so and continued to pay her mortgage, but it gave her enough chutzpah instead of getting underneath the covers and being depressed about it all to start her yeah. own business. And essential. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah. essential. So let's let's not punish the 99% because yes. 1% oh. is <laughs> going right. to blow it. You know what I mean? We'll deal with the 1% later. I love it. I absolutely love this conversation. I am on fire for Monday morning. Thank you so much, Kathy Rogers, for being here with us. I may call you on you again because uh, I have a little something coming up that I think you would be amazing for. So we'll talk about that later. Thank you so much for joining our Mindset Monday. I'm Shelly Butler. I mean, to set. And get your workout in. Love you. Love you. Bye, guys. Thank Great you. Great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.